Welcome, everyone. My name is Achut, and I will be your moderator this evening. Dr. Gerard Kugel, leading clinician and professor, is our speaker tonight, and he will introduce integrated workflows featuring digital impressions, CBCT 3D images, and the Sprint Ray 3D printer with a focus on implant planning and fabricating surgical guides. If at any point you have a question, please type it into the box labeled have a question, and we will conduct a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. To talk with other attendees, navigate to your control panel at the bottom of your screen and click the chat icon. If you would like to receive CE credit for this webinar, you can click the CE icon in your control panel to complete the form. <clears throat> please note, you will receive another email formally presenting you with your CE credit. If there are any CE questions, please email webinars at henryshine.com. Dr. Kugel, welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction and <clears throat> thank all of you for uh, offering to spend some time with me. It's been a busy day for me and I'm sure most of you. So let's try to make this as uh, painless as possible. Uh, so we're gonna talk about, as you well know, a um, little bit on digital workflow, uh, printing, implants, uh, surgical guide fabrication. Uh, my background, so let's click on my name there. Um, I do practice uh, a couple of days a week. I have a practice in downtown Boston. I've always been in uh, private practice as well at the, as at the university. So um, I do a fair amount of dentistry and as do some of the people working in my practice. And uh, what I just wanted to show you is Here's some of the doctors in our practice. We have uh, two surgeons in the practice, so I don't place implants as much as I restore them, and a uh, number of general dentists, so uh, it's a pretty busy practice. And I bring this up because it's important for you to understand, I, I do a lot of publications, I do a lot of research, uh, but I actually do a lot of hands-on dentistry, and I think that's important when you're lecturing to a group of clinicians. Um, so I did my first restorative implant case uh, in 1985, and it was a Bicon implant back then. And it's funny and interesting for me. Uh, uh, you can't see me, but you'd think I'm much younger than that, I'm sure. Uh -huh. um, it's interesting to see how far we've come in our treatment planning and our implant dentistry process. When I was a young dentist, it was... Uh, really kind of a shot in the dark. I would get cases back where the implants were not placed well. That happened very often. And uh, the surgeon, I love my surgeons in my practice and outside of my practice, they, you know, rub their hands and say, okay, it's all yours. So um, we don't have those issues or not nearly what we had in the past. So we're going to talk about the dentist and technician digital partnership as best we can. I will claim um, there's probably people out there, and I always have is issues when I do lectures nowadays. I'm sure the audience, I don't even know how many are out there, by the way, but there's probably a wide range of, of ability and background. So some of you maybe have done more than me, some less. Uh, so I'm open to anything and everybody, and I don't think I have an ego. So I'm always trying to learn, even at my young age. So let's keep going. Disclosure, which we all have to do, uh, I do a lot of research, and by the way, this isn't even all of the companies we do research for and with, besides doing some federal grant work I do, um, and I DCR research, I do a lot of corporate research. So the majority of these are corporate uh, projects that I've worked on. Uh, I think you can see my pointer, uh, p and I helped with the development of the white strips many, many, many years ago. And this is highlighted because I have a couple of patents in the sports guard industry, which is totally unrelated to today's lecture. This is my practice. I'm at Trinity Dental in Boston, right across the street from the Westin Hotel in Copley Place. <clears throat> we have uh, seven dental chairs. Uh, you can see we've been digital. I've been digital for many years, uh, both CAD CAM, uh, Trio Scanner, Itero we had for a while, but um, we do a lot of uh, digital dentistry more recently in the last five or six years, more 3D printing. However, and I'm not going to cover it in this lecture, I published in the area of printing uh, back in the probably 2008, uh, 2006 on the accuracy of SLA models and um, STL files being translated into printed models, the accuracy. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about printing as well. So again, uh, I do want to thank, because without, and I mean this with my sincere gratitude, Lee Culp, 
does my digital work with me in the practice. Lee's a fabulous technician. Many of you probably know him. Uh, if you're looking to get into this a little more um, uh, actively and de deeper, uh, Lee is one of the guys, Sculpture Studio. I've known Lee forever, for, unfortunately for both of us, probably. We've been around a long time, over 30 years. So Lee is in uh, North Carolina. He is amazing. Much of what I'm going to show you is Lee doing the design. I asked Lee recently, uh, recently meaning yesterday, uh, how many of your dentists do their own digital design? And he laughed. He said, Jerry, almost none of them at this point. Uh, I get the comb beam, I get the CBCT, I get the digital scan. Um, he really is modelless now. He does printing. He does all his digital mock-ups. He's been doing this forever. Um, not just my implant cases, my high-end uh, restorative cases. I have a few other labs I work with, but they're usually for the basic work. For anything more elaborate, I work with Lee. So I'm going to talk about him and thank him. The digital team. Boy, the world is different. Uh, again, I've been in this game for a long time. Um, if you talked about digital, when I was a young dentist, I would have just thought, yeah, maybe in the future, but not now. But uh, the future is now. So we're going to redefine roles in our dental practices. Um, we have looked at life a little differently. And by that, I mean, I now have a technician who really is a clinical technician. Lee knows dentistry. He knows what the needs are. He understands uh how to restore a case both with implants and restoratives, uh, full mouth reconstruction. So I have a clinical technician. I have to be a technical dentist. The, the, kind of the good thing, if you want to call it that, of listening to my lecture is I'm not a 25-year-old kid who played video games and can grab a computer and do things easily. I, um, I had to learn. I remember when I first took, and it was over 20 years ago, um, when I did my first CAD CAM course before we got CAD CAM in the office, uh, I brought one of my assistants, who's now Dr. Fox. I'm very proud to say 30 of my dental assistants, oh, more than 30, 32 are now dentists. But Lindsay was with me, and she was young, and she's scanning, and in like 20 minutes, she had it down. Uh, it took me hours, and I used to, I looked there. I said, Lindsay, how do you know how to do this? She goes, I know how to Google it. I just know. Well, I know now, but I didn't then. So I had to become a technical dentist. I wasn't a technical dentist. And then I need a surgeon who's a restorative surgeon because – in my day, the old days, I would give it to a surgeon. I didn't have much communication. They knew what I wanted. They placed an implant. They never had to restore it. They didn't care. I got stuck with it. So the world has changed. This is a nice shot of Lee. I teased him a little bit about this photo because it's a very dramatic shot. But Lee is definitely a digital technician. He takes my information and he makes my life easier. And I want my life to be easy because when I do 7 p.m. lectures after working all day, I need an easy life. And he helps me with that. So thanks, Lee. And I'll reference him a number of times. Uh, you need to find a laboratory that can do digital. They all do digital. Now, I remember about 15 years ago doing a lecture and saying, how many of you are doing digital dentistry? And, you know, back then, not as many hands went up. I said, no, you all are because all your labs are going digital. And I do mean that all the labs are digital. They're all printing their models. They're all they're they're doing their cases, you know, using the software, doing three shape, working up cases digitally. Um, you rarely, if ever, see and maybe the old timers doing things by hand anymore. This is a digital dental lab. This is what it looks like. So. You should know your lab, you should know their capabilities, and they should be able to do what your needs are. So I'm gonna show you some old slides on digital dentistry because I go way back, uh, meaning way back with scanning. I will tell you, and again, I'm not doing it in this lecture. Um, when I do my digital lecture, which is a little different, I show a lot of the references and some of the research uh, that we did years ago. So we did a lot of early, early research on accuracy of 3D scanning, uh, accuracy of, of CAD CAM in dentistry, accuracy of printing. And to be quite frank, they are accurate, as you all know. Anyone who tells you, like they did to me in the old days, that digital isn't as accurate is somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. And we're going to talk today about CBCT, about digital scans. Uh, we got our comb beam um, years ago now, but before having a comb beam, I did a lot of guesswork. Once we got our CBCT, life changed. Um, and when you combine that with your scanner and throw a printer into the mix, life is very interesting. I will give you a heads up for any older dentist on this call. Um, there is a learning curve, and unfortunately, sometimes that learning curve can take you a lot of time. I spent hours and hours 
sitting at a computer, sitting with my CBCT, trying to figure out how to read, read it, understand it. So uh, if you're like me, don't feel bad. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, we um, have to now mill much of our work. This is actually a lease shot on, uh, as I'm looking at the screen on my left, on the right is me in practice using our Sprint Ray printer. We're gonna talk about the Sprint Ray because that's what I use. There are other printers out there. So I'm not trying to sell you on anything. What you use is up to you. I do think the Sprint Ray is a good printer. I'm familiar with it. I like it. It's a very efficient and actually a cost point for dentists. The good thing about printing nowadays is from a cost standpoint, you know, what we buy in dentistry costs a lot. When you buy a printer, it doesn't cost a lot to get into the printing game. And, and if anybody has a printer, you know what I mean. And actually the learning curve on printing is actually a lot faster than uh, you might imagine, especially for dentists who are technical. And there are many of you on the call that are. This is Dr. Anderson. He works in the office. He's um, one of the owners. He flies in from California every other week. He's got a number of offices out on the West Coast. And that's uh, with a face scan. And that's our comb beam. And when we first got the comb beam, I had to learn how to use it. And I had to learn the value of it. And the value of a comb beam is uh, a CBCT is, is pretty, um, pretty impressive once you understand it. Uh, and this is just a shot showing our surgical guide fabrication. We pretty much now um, are doing all of our implants. And Dr. Anderson places a lot of implants as well. That's one of the things he comes in to do is place implants. We uh, really pretty much use a surgical guide now, you know, at the risk of, and, and again, I, at a point in my life, I guess I can say what I feel. Um, I think it's almost, it's almost malpractice not to do a surgical guide nowadays. They're easy to do. When I first learned how to do a surgical guide, probably again, over 20 years ago, uh, at a Nobel course, and I believe John Sorensen, a good friend of mine, was giving the course, it was a very complicated, expensive process. Nowadays, doing a surgical guide is not a complicated, not for me at least, <laughs> and it's a little bit different. Uh, when we first got our comb beam, before we had it, we would send out for our comb beams uh, to, a, a, there was a comb beam or a, a f imaging facility uh, just a couple of blocks from our office, so we'd send people, and then we decided why are we doing that? We're getting our own. And this is just a funny example, just to show you the value of your CBCT. This patient had a perio issue on vacation uh, on uh, Martha's Vineyard and really couldn't function because of an abscess. Got her in, took a radiograph, didn't look so bad, had the surgeon. And I said, look, we just got our CBCT. Let's do a CBCT. And the surgeon looked at it, Dr. Lascarides, and said, there's no point in trying to save this tooth. No point in doing any kind of a bone bone graft. He said, this tooth has to come out. Sounds like a funny point, but for me, I started looking at that CBCT as a whole nother level of diagnosis that I hadn't seen before. That same patient, and this is an old case that we did with 3D diagnostics. We took the CBCT, we took a stone model. Uh, I'm doing everything digital now, so this would be a scan. And we did a digital design of this case, had it confirmed. So we sent the CBCT, we sent the model to uh, a company that would do this. In, in this case, it was 3D Diagnostics. They sent back the, mo the uh, surgical guide mock-up for us, and here it is, working on where we're gonna place those implants. Things have changed um, dramatically. This at the time to me was state-of-the-art, but we have easier ways to do this today. But this is just showing you an example. We started printing our surgical guides not very long ago. This is a post-processor in our office. The one thing about Sprint Ray, which I really like, is their post-processing. They've really uh, made the process faster and easier. So one of the things is the printing is a little faster, the post-processing. Don't forget, you don't just take it out of the printer. You've got a post-process. So, um, And now we're using pretty much all printed models. Everything is digital. Uh, I rarely take an impression. I rarely use a model anymore. Uh, this is a video, and I, it's a quick one. This is when we got our Plan Mecca CBCT, and it was their demo, but it's very relevant on using their software to treatment plan for a implant surgical guide. So we got, and this is literally what my CBCTs look like. <clears throat> We're going to do a digital scan with my trails. We're going to superimpose that 
doing our marking so we know it's in the right position on the CBCT. So it does the match, lines that up. Now we're going to design the crown first. In the old days, this was unheard of, but now I will pick the crown design that I'm interested in. And we have a library of crowns. I'll position that crown where I, as a restorative dentist, would like it, not where the surgeon wants to place the implant. And if you're placing your own implants, that's great. Single tooth implants are not so difficult with a surgical guide. Position that crown. Then we mark the landmarks so we don't cause any damage, obviously. I mean, think about when I started doing this in the 80s, what a difference. Now the implant placement will be placed based on where I want the crown position to be. And your lab can do all this. You don't need to do this. Uh, Lee will do this for me using different software, but he does basically the same thing. We'll show that later. Now we're going to design our implant guide, you will, or your lab. And for those who do it themselves, God bless you. And I've done it, but I don't do it myself anymore. I will confirm it, obviously. I'll confirm the implant placement. I'll confirm the guide. Just cleaning that up, erasing the excess you don't need. yourself obviously you can then do your own 3d printing of the guide or if you're working with a lab you can send that out what we'll often do is i'll uh, have the lab or dr anderson when he's doing an implant case we'll have the lab do the surgical guide um, treatment planning and then we'll print them at the office now this is an older case as i was telling you so we were using stone models i'll show you the newer cases we're doing which are all printed models um, and the beauty of printing is there's so many, I mean, I'm sure you all know, storage of data, saving information from models that I need at a later time. I can go on and on. Uh, and once you get familiar with 3D printing, it is not that complicated. Trust me, because if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, here we are doing our surgical guide. And here's that patient. She's got a keystone, what we call fat boy, I guess, on the maxilla because she had some issues with her sinus and she has two lower implants that have been restored. This is Vincent, and I'm showing you the value of a CBCT. Vincent uh, had an implant placed by a surgeon, not in my office, years earlier, was having pain on it. So Vincent uh, comes in, I take a look and I do a radiograph of the implant. Doesn't look so bad on that radiograph, but then we have our, this is a while ago, we have our CBCT. We decide to do our comb beam and sure enough, we see that there is really no bone uh, around probably three quarters at an implant. The reason it's an interesting story, I would not have been able to do this diagnosis without the CBCT in the office. And the beauty is uh, Vincent was gonna come in to be treated. He calls me up and says, well, Dr. Kugel, you don't have to worry about pulling that implant out. I was pushing on it with my tongue and then I took it out with my fingers. So uh, when implants fail, they fail. Uh, I might add on a side note, I'm seeing a lot of failed implants lately. So. Um, we could go on and on. Partly, I think, occlusion. All your implants should be in a, a night guard. We just did a paper on that. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of reasons why implants fail. Also, a lot of more are being placed. This is, again, looking at his implant and realizing on this CBCT that that implant was a goner, uh, and it was. This is an older case, and I'm just going to show it to you real quickly. Um, and this was done with stone models, but with a surgical guide. So the implants are placed. And this is not to cover the case, just more to show you the guide. Surgical guide being used, this makes life so much easier for me as a restorative dentist and or the implant placing dentist. And we're going to leave some teeth to hold the temporaries. And this is just a quick and, and quick case. Um, Kitty Malamut's technician did all of this work, uh, beautiful work. And you can see the screw retained implant case, and that's the final restoration in place before, after, but surgical guide is critical. So let's talk a little bit about our digital planning because that's why you're here. 
So digital planning requires technology. We already know that. So we need our scanner, we need our comb beam, uh, and we need a lab tech who knows what he or she is doing and that you're comfortable with. So implant workflow, surgical planning. Here's a case that, uh, and Lee, the reason Lee was so helpful to me on these cases and showing me this is that he's got everything from the images of the pre-op to all of the surgical planning. So here's your preoperative photo implant needed on that lower anterior tooth. This is Lee doing his workup digitally. Um, pretty shot, but just kind of show you what's going on in the pixels and um, you know, how he works on his end. Here's my trio scan, and here's Lee placing my, my tooth. Uh, I do a lot of full mouth cases, and I'll have Lee do a digital mock-up for me, you know, and, and we're not covering that opening vertical dimensions. Then I'll have printed temporary sent to me after I do the preps. I'll put them in temps, and I'll do a printed temp, uh, which will be based on Lee's workup, and then I'll get the vertical dimension, make sure the occlusion's correct. I've done a lot of big occlusion cases, redoing almost always other people's work. But thanks to digital and digital planning, then the temps, if the patient's comfortable, he'll mimic the temps. If he's not comfortable, I'll scan what I've done to adjust the temps. And this is all so simple nowadays. Here we are with the trios. Lee works up the placement. Here we are looking at our implant location. So uh, I send my information to my technician, Lee Culp. Lee will then take uh, and decide or look at the implant placement. Then I'll get on with Lee live. We'll review the case. We'll look at the implant placement. If my surgeon's doing it, the surgeon will be there. Uh, reviewing the case, the beauty of working in a group practice, we can often do this as a team. Uh, I'll often have patients, if it's a full mouth case and I'm doing the digital workup, I'll get them on a Zoom uh, with Lee and I get charged for that. But on those cases, it's worth it. And we'll review the case with the patient before we even get to the temporary phase. So here we are doing our workup implant design, confirm with the surgeon. We're deciding, do we need to do bone augmentation in this case? Uh, if we do bone augmentation, there's software that will allow us to do this, I'll show you a case later. Hopefully we'll get to it. As my wife always tells me, I put in too many slides. So I'll do my best. If not, you can come back and listen to more later. Uh, place the implant and determine if augmentation is necessary. And Lee made this comment, he's right, the software does it all. Um, once you know what you're doing with the software, whether you're doing it or your tech is doing it, uh, the software is pretty incredible. Uh, in terms of what it can do for us in our treatment planning. Uh, we have to decide, is it going to be screw retained or is it going to be cemented? That depends on the implant position. So based on this design, my confirmation of design, we can do screw retained. Um, and that's important because we, we need to know that and uh, our lab tech should be able to make that decision. In this case, the sleeve is being centered between the two adjacent, adjacent teeth. So it will work. We have room for the implant placement. We can fit that sleeves a little larger than the implant will be. Um, we're going to do a custom temp on this patient. So they're going to walk away uh, when it's placed with an immediate temporary. And that's your call. Um, flipper, if you think there's an issue with healing, but I want that soft tissue to meet my needs. So we're going to now take our scan. We've got our tooth already designed. So remember, the tooth comes first. The beauty of dentistry today, where in the past the tooth was a second thought after the implant was placed wherever it was going to be placed by the surgeon. So we import the surgical guide into the software. We put a four millimeter hole for the three millimeter implant, and then uh, we're going to do our provisional design. Here's the provisional design. And the beauty is that this provisional will fit, if not perfectly, pretty close to it. Um, you're going to have to add some composite, of course, at the end. to get it to stay on the cylinder. But here we are, and you can see the orifice is going to be about four millimeters for that three millimeter implant. Uh, here we are doing it all digital once again. You can print this model if you choose to, but this is all being done digitally again at this point. So um, very little use of any for certainly a stone model. Uh, and for a printed model, yes, you can use your printed model. So immediate style, small design file. Here we are looking at our implant placement, looking at our cylinder. There we are looking at where our temp will be placed at the immediate placement of the implant. Uh, so we're then doing our smile design and this would be your technician 
either sharing this with you and I guess in some cases just sending it back to you if you trust your tech. Here is Sprint Ray. I was talking to uh, Lee about this a couple of times recently. Lee loves Sprint Ray, and I'm not telling you this because I have any reason to. I'm not getting anything from Sprint Ray, but the reason I say it to you is the Sprint Ray is fast, it's efficient, it's inexpensive. Uh, there are other printers out there that are just bigger, clunkier, slower, and the post processing is slower. Um, so for a kind of everyday use, and you can get uh, one of these printers at a reasonable price, uh, you know, we didn't break the bank, trust me, on doing our printing setup. Not like it did when we did CAD CAM in the office. That was expensive. Printing was not. So Lee uh, uses the Sprint Ray. Uh, in the old days, you'd mill these, but what we're doing now is pretty much printing them, printing our custom temps. We're printing our, in this case, our immediate temp that'll be placed after the implant is placed. So I left milled in because the one you're looking at was milled, but we're printing them now. Lee is printing them or we're printing them in the office. He can send us a file we can print, but I'm going to tell you, my life is busy. It's, um, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not as stressed as maybe I could be or should be, but it is busy. And the reason I bring that up is I don't need to do as much work as I used to. So if I can get these back printed by the lab, that's fine. If you want to print them in your office, that's fine. Um, implant Pontic is put over the cylinder. It's in a perfect location. We're going to add composite. So we have to add a little bit of composite, a little flowable uh, to, to attach it to our implant um, cylinder or abutment and uh, temporary. And here we're going to use these wings so that we can get seated. Those will be cut off once we get it positioned. Here's our surgical guide in place on a printed model. Here we are putting the surgical guide clinically um, in the patient's mouth. We're going to use this to place our implant Here's the implant. Um, we're going to secure our composite, our temporary to the cylinder. Uh, we're going to use a little bit of composite for this. Here we are placing it, which then we'll cut these wings off after. So we're securing that. Here's our temporary. Here's our immediate temp. It's a little bit gray, which is not an uncommon issue, particularly if I'm, well, B shades, of course, always can have that gray tone, but it is the temp. And here is the final restoration. You can see that tissue ad adaptation was, was quite nice. Uh, and the beauty of this is life is significantly easier than it was in the old days. That's for sure. Now, the next one I want to show you is a case Lee actually shared with me. And I want to thank um, Jonathan and Lee. Jonathan is a great dentist. Lee's a great technician. Uh, I've done a lot of scan bodies, and I've done a lot of ENCODE uh, healing cap scans, um, not as many as I'd like. Uh, this is Lee's first, one of his first totally uh, digital and modelless cases. Again, these are older cases, so there were no models. This was all done digitally. Here's the pre-op of the bridge that's failed. Here's the scan after the bridge is extracted. Here are the implants placed, um, and they were done with a surgical guide. Here are the scan bodies in place. So what was interesting, and I, when I first started doing these a while ago, um, it, I thought it was amazing that I could get such good, such good results of my prosthetic restorations doing it with this technique. And now, of course, it's pretty standard, but at the time it was a little more uh, elaborate intraoral scan and scan bodies and here we are showing the scan bodies on a digital scan and the workup which lee is doing again here is lee with the scan bodies we're going to do virtual scan flags so this is really the old days if we'd be doing this with models here we're doing it all digitally again uh, a workup this would be shared with the prosthetic uh, restorative dentist Here's Lee designing the crown position. Remember, it's a little different. In this case, the implants are placed. Uh, placement is quite nice. Um, when I was talking to Lee about this case, he was very happy it turned out as well as it did because at the time there was a little bit of a learning curve going on. Again, software proposal for the design of where those uh, crowns will be. Here we are again going through the digital design. It's not been finalized yet. 
And then the software, along with the technician and your help, if you choose to, will design the margins of the abutments. So again, these are gonna, you have abutments uh, that are designed. You can see the margins are being designed to confirm. We can see the crowns being fit to those abutments. We can see holes for the screw being designed as well, all being done by your technician, or if it's you, that's wonderful. But in my case, the technician, here are the screw holes. Here's the internal design. And again, this is an older case. It's gonna be fit to the abutments. Here we are with the holes. Here we are with the implant ready to be placed. Here they are with the screw holes and being done by the technician. And here is the final case screwed in and delivered. So that was a little different because it was not so much showing you the CBCT, but showing you kind of a pretty straightforward case. Um, what we're gonna do next is all on X. Uh, it can be all on four, but it always depends. It can be all on five, whatever, but uh, all on X case. So let's go through this. This gets a little more uh, involved. That's why I flew through the last one. So we're gonna talk about the surgical and restorative planning. So all on X, all on four, all on X treatment concepts. With its use of straight and angled multi-unit abutments, this was developed to provide an edentulous patient and assumed to be a edentulous patient with an immediate load full arch res restoration um, on only four implants. Four, it can be more than that. I'm going to show a case with five. So it's, but let's say all on four. Uh, the location and the placement of the implant is is certainly relevant for the restorative dentists that are in placing them. Um, you want those posteriors to be angled for integration reasons, but placement's important. So a surgical guide, CBCT, and digital scan is absolutely required for this to be successful. So. In this case, the implant's gonna start with an existing denture. So what Lee does is you get the comb beam, CBCT, you get the uh, scan of the denture, and then using the denture placement, he started to design the implant placement. So we're gonna marry a couple of things in this case. I'll show you another one after this. Here is Lee working on the surgical guide design using the software, uh, the three shape software. He's looking at the position of the implants. You'd prefer the posterior implants to be angled. You'd prefer the anteriors to be pretty parallel if possible. Um, not always possible, but that's what you'd be shooting for in this case. What Lee does, and I, I'm not gonna show you the, the, the clinical result because I don't have the photograph at this point, but this is gonna be your temporary uh, implant denture. It's you know fixed. But uh, what he's doing is when you're doing your temporary, he, Lee likes to design it with this palatal support and you've got flanges on it. And those flanges are so that when you seat it, you get correct seatment. It is amazing when you do this, how well these fit in the mouth. So this is designed and we use the original denture. Now we're designing this as our temporary. So it's, it's a marriage of restorative treatment and implant design. So here we are superimposing our implant guide over our restorative work. This again will be a temporary restoration. And these are some of the images of the surgical guide and you can see the marriage of the surgical guide to the final restoration. Then these will be cut off. The flanges will be removed uh, after it's placed, but this would be for seating. So you have stability when you seat the temporary restoration. And you can see our flanges here, which you're not going to keep on, but they will help you in the seating. So the beauty of these cases is sometimes they're just too easy. Again, if they're treatment plan correctly. So I just want to show you the, the marriage of our guide to our restorative treatment. So here's a clinical case um, that makes that story a little more complete. Um, it's going to be a lower case. Um, it's... An interesting case, um, I'll explain why. So you have the upper teeth, the lower teeth are gonna be removed, obviously. You can see the radiograph, um, a lot of periodontal involvement. 
a lot of issues. So the first thing that we do is after we do our scan, Lee will do his workup of the restorative case first. Uh, we have to confirm vertical dimension, anterior tooth position, midline, all the good stuff that you do for everything else that we do in dentistry, we still do that. Then Lee is gonna marry the restorative to the surgical guide. So here he is with the cylinders. Here we are truly marrying the restorative to our placement, our implant placement. Um, trying to angle those posteriors as possible, um, depending on our bone and our comb beam and what we've been able to work out. So staying away from any landmarks that we have, like our nerve, as you well know, on the mandibular. Uh, and here we are, you can see on the right-hand side, my right-hand side, you can see the surgical guide being superimposed over the restorative uh, case and the temporary. So it's truly a marriage of surgery, prosthetics, and technology. Here's a case when the lower teeth are no longer in place. Here's a case with the mock-up of what we're going to do in our final or in our temporary slash final. Once you get the temporary restoration in and the tissue heals, the final is pretty easy because you've got everything worked out. Aesthetics, function, occlusion. Um, I keep bringing back the past because in the past this was could be a nightmare. Here's our surgical guide. And you can see again, marrying it to the prosthetic treatment. And looking at the angle and placement of the implants, because uh, the all on X, it's important that that placement be where you want it to be. I'll show you radiographs at the end of that. Here we are with the surgical guide. This is all being designed right now. And this was actually, you can see here a still model. This would all be done with printed models. Here we are with our digital design. Here we are with our mock-up of the teeth, teeth location, occlusion, vertical dimension. This is for stability. So when this is designed, he uses these flanges so that we can get stability and check that implant placement. Tightly linking surgical and restorative planning, as you can see. So restorative, surgical, and the marriage of our surgical and restorative treatment. Immediately loaded full arch on four implants, two placed vertically in the anterior and two placed at, oh, oh sorry, my wife will call me am and angle up to 45 degrees. Let's show that again. Here's our prosthetic guide. Here's our printed models in this case. So this was a printed, you saw our stone model earlier, now we're using printed. Here's our printed model with our surgical guide on the printed model. This is uh, for our mock-up and our try-in, and you can see for stability, we put these flanges on it. Here we are, the printed models. Extraction, guide verification. Osteotomy to the depth, uh, followed by extraction. Prosthetic guide is placed, so we can verify the vertical dimension uh, and the osteotomy position. Uh, here we are, our vertical reduction and alveolectomy. So we're making this based on our prosthetic guide so we know we have the right position. Complete osteotomy, implant installation, confirming implant placement again with the mock-up of the restorative on the lower restoration. Here are the implants. Check the prosthesis. Check the cylinder location and orientation. And that's our lower mock-up taking a bite registration of that mock-up. Here we are doing a pickup of that same mock-up of our final restoration. Here we're gonna use a little flowable composite or acrylic to secure the temporary coping to the bridge, making sure uh, to keep the screw access hole free from composite. Obviously we don't wanna hide that. With all on four, uh, treatment concepts supported by all acrylic or, or composite or resin uh, restorations as a provisional prosthetic uh, it's screwed onto the implants right after surgery. You can see the sutures. This is going to leave with the patient. That's the beauty of the all on X, all on four. Then here you can see the placement, immediate load, four implants, two are placed vertically 
and two are placed at an angle. We can see the angled implants. Um, you're going to do that because it helps promote integration uh, with the angled implant. It can go up to 45 degrees. Anybody doing Nobel, um, we know that they are um, quite competent in this. By tilting the two posterior implants, the bone to implant contact is enhanced. We have more surface area providing optimized bone support, even middle, with minimal bone volume. Tilting the implants helps avoid also vital structures. If you can do a little bit of a tilt on that implant, that's why a surgical guide is, is important and the placement is critical on all on four. Uh, and in the maxilla, of course, we can avoid the sinus and we can optimize the load and allow for up to 12 teeth on that final restoration. After adequate healing time, the final restoration is fabricated using a new scan or impression. And here we are with the final restoration. Here we are with the placement. Here we are with the patient. And we'll do this a little bit. The concept is, so do we reduce or do we augment the bone? Now, this is a Lee case that he shared because I have really not done a lot of these bone augmentation cases. Um, Lee was quite excited about this as a prospect. Bone reduction with a guide is something that is more common doing bone augmentation is I think pretty interesting, at least to me. And some of you may know, have done this. Um, for me, this is a little bit new. So here is where the implants look like they should be placed. But as you can see from this CBCT and the three shape, there's no bone in that position. We need bone. But if we want an ideal placement, we're gonna have to do a little bit of work on this one. So here's Lee doing the design. So he's taking that scan, he's taking his three shape, he's looking at a position, he's looking at the final restoration to see what, what are the needs of that implant. And we can see those implants right now are in trouble if we try to place them where they, where they should be theoretically. Probably gonna jump a little bit because I wanna get through this. All right, so we're doing that design. Now we're taking a look, look at that bone. We need bone. So we're gonna take a look at that, that case. And again, the software does it all. We're gonna look at if we augment the bone, whether or not we're going to be able to get the restorations where we want them aesthetically and functionally. So we're looking at where the surgical guide should be placed in order to place those implants where we think we need them and our restoration. So Lee is working on that workup. And again, I'm not doing this. This would be the lab tech, your digital tech, who's really a digital clinician at some level. If you think about, again, the skill set to be able to do this at this level. Doing our design, that's where the implants will be, but we still need to augment that bone. So this is all being done prior. Now there's the bone augmentation, and this is all done by the software. So in order to put those implants where we want them, we're gonna to have to augment the bone. And we're looking at augmenting the bone to that level. Here's the bone augmentation that's suggested. And again, this is all being done without a patient, without a model, as you well know. Okay, how much longer is this one? And Lee has said that uh, at this point, now that's the mesh being designed so that we can do the bone augmentation using that surgical mesh. And I'll show a case if I hopefully get to it on the lower where we do the same. So the design, the mesh is designed, the bone augmentation has been decided on, the implant placement has been designed. Now here's a case, um, this will show you the bone augmentation this is a, actually a dentist, and the question was, or will be, why not remove those flared teeth? Um, this dentist did not want those teeth removed. Uh, it would have been a lot easier to, to do a full mouth, certainly mandibular, um, but we couldn't do that. So uh, you'll see why it is a little weird, because look at that flare. So again, here we are, our Lee is designing those posterior, the tooth position. And this bone needs to be augmented as well. I just had a case this week. We did a CBCT. She needs implants. She's got no ridge. 
um, we can't place the implants in her condition without doing bone augmentation. So, um, let's see how much time we have here. And there is where the tooth placement would be ideal. So again, we start with the restorative and then we work our way backwards. Position. Maxillary teeth are put in place. This will all be confirmed in the mouth. Let's move. Now we're going to do our implant design after we did our restorative design. Uh, we look at implant placement. We look at landmarks, as you can see. We confirm this with the surgeon or the dentist, depending on who's doing the implants. And this is a little bit of what I showed you earlier, but this is a little more advanced. There's that anterior flare. You can see how much bone loss we have and where we're going to do the bone augmentation. We is going to the implant library, picking what implant would be best given our CBCT. This is prior to any bone augmentation. And we can mock up the bone augmentation as well, just showing some of the issues that are going to happen if you try placing this implant in the position it is now. Crown position over the implant. Landmarks define angle of the implant. Again, some of you have done this, some of you haven't. Where we want the restorations to be. I'm going to speed this up a little bit because I'm looking at my clock. I can see again what many of you know implant position, angle of the implant, restorative design. And run through this so I can get to the end and move on to the clinical. All right, so next thing we're going to do is talk about the bone augmentation design. So Lee is actually going to use the software to do the bone augmentation. And I'm going to speed this up again. So you're going to have to watch this in fast time. Implants. Bone blocks. Do it as a block just to make life a little easier here. How much bone are we going to need to get those implants where we want them? To save the patient from any landmarks being damaged. And also this dentist, I should say. So Lee is doing this. And I... I give Lee credit because I have not done this bone augmentation software work he has. So that's working up the bone augmentation. We're going to do our models, our sprint ray. We're going to print the models. So these are our printed models of that patient. And we print, we print our models all the time in practice. We print our night guards. We print our surgical guides. Um, you know, we're, we're printing, um, um, we're going to be starting, we're printing our temporaries now. This is another, I have a lot of these videos, so let's see. Check the time on this. Let's move this forward as well so I can speed this up a little bit for you. And we can see we're looking at where we're going to put our cylinders. We already designed our bone augmentation, which you can see there. We're going to design a mesh. Let's go to the next slide. Let's skip this, skip this, because we already covered some of this. Here is that patient with the mesh that, um, it's, it's a funny thing, the FDA, there's some issues with these meshes. You can actually make them with the holes in them. That mesh will be used on that patient where the lower bone augmentation is going to be done. Here we are looking at where we need the bone. Here's that mesh. So we know where the mesh is. That mesh was based on the work that Lee did to do the mock-up of where the bone needs to be. So we're going to do tissue engineering uh, for this implant case, which means we're going to use bone morphogenic protein. Um, we're going to use um, cancellous bone. Uh, we're going to use, um, which is spongy bone, as you know. 
we're going to use freeze dried bone aggregate. So we'll show that whole case. Here we are. So a flap is laid. Um, this is done by the surgeon, not me at this point. Uh, flap is laid, cortical perforations, Lataja's bone is taken. Uh, the mesh is put in position. And it is truly tissue engineering. Mesh placement, mesh is fixated. And then using bone morphogenic protein, which, by the way, I started working on research on bone morphogenic proteins in the early 90s, late 80s. So using our Tajin's bone and then using freeze-dried bone aggregate. So um, it's a relatively complicated, I guess, surgery. This is two weeks post-op, four weeks post-op. Take a look at that ridge. You can see what I mean about those anterior teeth being flared. Here's that cross-sectional image. Nine months after, you can see, look at the bone. That's all bone that we that was grown theoretically, and it was tissue engineered in that patient. Here is the tissue engineered surgery. These are the nine months after. You can see where the mesh is, where the bone is. Here we are pre-op. Here's ten months. Look at that. Again, ten months post-op, implant surgery is done. You know, the implants are being placed. You can see where you couldn't place them, now you can place them. And this was actually a published uh, paper. Um, Lee talks about this in a paper in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. And thank you. So the bone augmentation I showed you, it's kind of new stuff. It's kind of cool um, and bone reduction. So, and there's a lot of other things happening in the digital world. I mean, it seems to me that every time I turn around there's something new and exciting going on and keeping up with it at this point in my life is not the easiest thing. So I like giving these lectures because it makes me stay on my toes, I guess. So I appreciate you guys paying attention. we got a few minutes left. Um, and if you guys have any questions that I can answer, I'll try to do my best. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kugel. Uh, as a reminder, mm -hmm. If anyone would like to earn CE credit for tonight's webinar, please click the CE icon in your control panel to complete the short survey. We do have some questions, doctor, so let's jump right in. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, our first question is from Colin, doctor. Uh, he's asked, since you've had what seems like many IO scanners, which one do you like the most and why? All right, that's a, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, you know, having CIRAC, um scanner which was great we had the the um we also had the e4d in the early days i like my trio scanner i mean i think itero is fine don't get me wrong um i like the trios the problem with the trios of course if you're doing um if you're doing ortho and invisalign you have an issue but i like to show scanner because it it was easily married to three shape um because it's pretty much the same company but the reason uh, I like it easy to use, uh, very user friendly. Um, I mean, the cost point is not outrageous. There are a lot of scanners starting to come out now, but I'm used to the trios. It's reliable. I actually tested it in a clinical, in a study with one of the graduate students years ago on accuracy. It's quite accurate. Um, so the price point is something that you need to think about. Once you go digital and you start scanning, you're not going back. Anybody who's doing conventional, impressions who goes digital almost laughs at themselves for not having gone digital earlier. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of good ones out there. Uh, play with them at the shows. Trios is a good, reliable one, a little more on the higher end side cost wise, but good support, good use and labs like it. I would also recommend anybody looking to buy a scanner. I would talk to your lab as well to make sure that there's no issue. I think almost all of them will tell you a Trios is fine. But if you're going to buy some generic scanner, I'd be a little careful at this point. Uh, just make sure that that scanner is your lab is comfortable with it and it's compatible with whatever software they have. Thank you, doctor. Uh, a related question we got was, what software do you recommend for planning? Uh, three shape, but you might want to. There's a lot of new software coming out. Um, so if you're going to do your own design, uh, you might want to uh, if you've got a good digital tech. You're probably going to work with your tech. So I'll give you an example. 
Um, I'm using the same software Lee's going to use because I don't want to be using different software. It makes my life miserable. So if you've got a, you're going to have to have a tech, even if you're doing your own design. And I, I wish I did more of my own design, but again, my life's a little complicated, uh, meaning it's busy. You might want to talk to your lab tech and marry your software to theirs for a bunch of reasons. One, your lab tech, he or she's going to know what they're doing with it. Uh, secondly, if you're going to be doing a case and you're going to have your lab tech working with you, it'd be nice if you can talk to them. Um, but it's come a long way. I remember 15 years ago, sitting with some of the techs 20 years ago at the lab meeting in Chicago, and it was a big deal to do some of this. Now, every lab tech knows how to do this and every lab tech knows how to design. So check with your lab tech, but 3Shape is, is good software. And you could see that was a lot of the software that was being used for these designs. The only problem in your practice, there is a pretty good cost to it and they all get you with the updates and you have to pay for the user fee and you know, they get you on all those other costs. Chad and I were complaining about how we got to keep paying these fees uh, for the stuff that we bought. But yeah, that's my long answer to your short question. Hey, doctor. Our next question yeah. uh, is from Ellie. She wanted to know, is the mesh being made or printed by the lab? It's being made by the lab. Um, it's funny you say that. I, you can't do the printed mesh. The lab's making it based on that design. There, what, there is an issue, not to get into it, I guess, but um, it's got to do with the FDA approving some of these meshes. Um, I will tell you that Lee, and I keep bringing Lee up because he's been a big help to me, Lee's working with a couple of companies, and I won't mention their names, because uh, the 510K on some of those meshes um, is a little questionable, but there are a couple of meshes coming out now that are, that are 510K approved, and I know Lee's working with a couple of companies on designing some of these, uh, some programs and some ways to make those meshes easy to use and more compatible. It is fascinating to me because I, you know, I've been in a game again a long time. And, you know, to look at bone augmentation like that is pretty impressive, you know, because then there was a day when I couldn't get that kind of result. And you don't always get it. You know, the old story is you're looking at the best results. You're not looking at the fails. Every dentist who gives you a lecture doesn't show the failures, but I haven't really done those. I got that augmentation, uh, those slides from Lee. He's done all that design because it is pretty fascinating. Bone reduction, doing it digitally and digital design isn't so bad. Doing bone augmentation is much more interesting and is the way of the future. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but yeah, they're, they're out there. They're just becoming approved now. So Thank you, doctor. And then we had uh, two questions from uh, one of our attendees. Their first mm -hmm. question was, what tasks can you delegate to a dental assistant in this process? Mm. That's a great question because <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, my wife, who's actually listening to this, uh, looked this up once because we were trying to figure out, she was trying to figure out what we can delegate. I think, um, and I might be wrong, so if she was able to hone in. Uh, it depends on your state. Every state's got different regulations. I'm in Massachusetts, and we're probably like California. We're pretty regulated in terms of what assistants can do. Theoretically, your assistant can't do a final impression. And I don't want to go to jail for saying this, but every dentist who scans has their dental assistant scan the impression, uh, scan the prep. Um, but theoretically, they're not supposed to. So what you can do is have them do the scan, just cut out the tooth that you've prepped, if you're just doing a simple tooth preparation, do the scan yourself. But I think that in most cases, unless the, you know, the dental assisting police show up, most people are letting their assistant scan. Where well, you do run into a problem, and not to make it a long story, digital dentistry requires a lot of skill. And it requires, I hate to say it, assistants with a fair amount of skill. They're hard to find. And I live in the real world and we have trouble with assistants like everybody. One of the reasons I had so many assistants, I've had so many assistants that have been dental students, we seek out people like that that want to go to dental school, partly because they're motivated and um, usually, I hate to say, uh, pretty bright for the most part. Uh, not that dental assistants that aren't going to dental school aren't bright. Uh, but we do need somebody with a good skill set. So scanning is not a big deal. Most assistants can pick it up, but printing is a little more involved and certainly doing any kind of digital design. I would never have them do that. Although for CAD CAM, we, we trained our assistants early on. So it depends on your state. Theoretically, in many states, they can't do the final impression and your scan would be. So you really need to go online. It's pretty easy to do and download the state regulations. I have them actually, I'm looking at my bookshelf. I have a big 
wad of paper on there. One of them is the regulations for dental assistants. And in our state, there's different levels of dental assistants based on their training and more advanced training can do more. So check on your state requirements. Um, but good luck getting, getting good dental assistants is tough, but once you get one, do what you can to keep that assistant because they are worth their weight in gold. Thank you, doctor. And I think this might be our last question. Uh, okay. How do you communicate with an oral surgeon about using meshes? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. In, in my case, the surgeons are in the office, so it's a little bit easy. One of the things you, you, you might want to do, and this sounds funny, is um, pick up, and there's a couple of articles. I showed you that Lee had done uh, one on digital design. There's a couple of papers, recent ones, on using the mesh. Um, and the other option is call sculpture and have, um, it might be interesting for you, if you have a surgeon that's a little skeptical, get your CBCT, um, send that to Lee. Lee can actually show them digitally what would be needed and how the augmentation would be made and even how the mesh design would be done to see whether the surgeon buys into it. But the surgeon also has to be comfortable using the bone morphogenic protein and using the, you know, freeze dried bone aggregate. I think most good surgeons are where you run into a problem is if you're, a, if you're a general dentist doing implants, this is probably something that's a little bit out of your league at this point. So this would have to be perio or, or oral surgery, but uh, contact Lee's lab sculpture and tell them you're interested and they can actually communicate with your surgeon. I think you doing it may be tough, but the lab with some examples or, some of the stuff I showed you would be interesting. Um, you're gonna see more and more surgeons doing this. I think it's gonna become a little, little more routine than it has been. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Once again, yeah. if anyone attending would like CE credit, please click the CE icon in your control panel and complete the quick form. We'll receive another email tomorrow presenting you with the CE credit. I'd like to thank Dr. Kuhl again for the great presentation, doctor. Thank you. And of thank course, you. thanks for all our attendees. Thank I you for staying on board, and and I want to thank you guys for setting this up. And uh, yeah, I do appreciate it. It was uh, it was kind of fun putting this together. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate everyone's feedback. We are survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. We did record tonight's webinar, so we will email the recording out via email sometime next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doctor Kugel. Have a great night. Thank you, guys. Take care, everybody. Good night. <laughs>